بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد صدق الله العظيم and good evening ladies and gentlemen. I'm Sarva Tessan, Executive Director with the CFS Society of Pakistan. Uh, it is with immense pleasure that I welcome you all to the book launch of Dr. Ishu Tessan's captivating biography, Unraveling Gordian Knots, uh, authored by Mr. Sipten Nakwe. Uh, Dr. Ishu is a name which needs no introduction to this August gathering. The country has vastly benefited from his rich international experience. And today we hope to learn a few things from his productive life journey. I have been lucky to work with him at IBA and his mentorship has been priceless for my own personal development. Uh, this year marks uh, 20 years of CFA Society Pakistan and we have passed three presidents here uh, who have contributed to the development of this uh, society. Um, the mission of the CFA Society is to promote highest standards of um, ethics and professionals professionalism in the financial industry. Um, I would like to now thank our esteemed um, and distinguished guests, uh, Dr. Shukasyan, of course, um, former chairman of National Bank, Mr. Zubair Sumro, former CEO of uh, Habib Metropolitan Bank, Mr. Surajuddin Aziz, uh, president and editor-in-chief of Old Media Group, Mr. Amir Zira, rector Maid, um, Dr. Huma Bakai, and the author Sikten Nakwi, and of course, Sayyid Raza uh, Jafri, who is the moderator of the event. Um, let me uh, hold you no further, and may I request Mr. Zubair Sumro, uh, who has been recently the chairman of the National Bank, and served on the boards of all three financial sector regulators. He commenced his career at Citibank, before being the president and CEO of UBL, and then, which was then a public sector bank, and it ready did for privatization before he continued his career back with the city bank. May I request Mr. Mr. Zubair Sumru to please come on the stage? Thank you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Dr. Ishrat, distinguished guests. You know, I should start by mentioning how old our association, my families, is with Dr. Ishrat. As I was going through unraveling Gordian knots, I was trying to do that myself, that, um, you know, I was reminded that when he began his career in the civil service in the 60s, that he was posted to Shikarpur, uh, our hometown. And there uh, he was dealing, among other people, with my grandfather. So from my grandfather, there were dealings with my father over many years in the government and otherwise. Uh, then with myself, starting from UBL, but actually, we first met uh, now, I think, about 50 years ago when I was a student at the London School of Economics and Dr. Ishrat was traveling to the US and uh, my father had put us together and I remember we had a meal in London and I received career advice uh, at that stage when I was just about to begin this whole process. And after that, you know, my grandfather, my father, and myself, my son worked with Dr. Ishrat. He was teaching business law at the IBA when Dr. Ishrat was there uh, as the dean. So ours is an old and deep association. You know, I was reminded as I was driving here, and I must say, parking here is a challenge at the PC. It's a real challenge. But as I was uh, uh, driving here, I was thinking that the crises that the country is going through, generally what you hear, two central features of that 
causes, features, whatever you describe them as. One is the lack of strong institutions, too few of them. The second is the quality of our administration. These, you know, keep coming back to remind one of two central problems. And Dr. Ishrat, in a very difficult environment with enormous resistance, has worked on both of these. And I think the, the sort of persistence that has been shown and the quality of the work that has been produced is very, is exceptional. We know that. But look, in the time that I have, I was told 15 minutes, I will try and make it shorter. That let me first start referring to the book itself. And then I will work my way back to uh, Dr. Ishrat himself as a person. Uh, and finally, to close with some comments on legacies. So on the book itself, you know, it's a 400-page-plus it's a book. So you may find it a little daunting when you pick it up. But actually, the way it is written, it is not just the style and the clarity, but it's the fact that, you know, it is not what I would call a passive biography. You know, where the author sits and observes the life of someone, and it's, it's like a, almost a one-dimensional approach. That's not what this is. Here, what Sipten has done is to take anecdotes, insights, stories from many, many people over many years that dealt with Dr. Ishrat. And so you see not just his own analysis and comments, but through the eyes of many people, uh, you know, we may not know them personally, we probably don't, but we know of them. And, you know, and this makes it you know, much more of a living biography where you can trace the growth and the evolution. So I'd like to begin, I'll just read a little bit from the first story that I picked up. There are many before this, but you know, this is when he was with the World Bank, he was traveling to meet the president of Tajikistan. And while he was in Tajikistan, he got a call from Pakistan. So I will just very quickly uh, and briefly read that to you. It says, at around 1 p.m. at night, he, meaning Dr. Ishrat, was awakened by the insistent ringing of his phone. I'm picking up different sentences to make it shorter. A crisp military voice was at the other end. Brigadier S.M. Mujtaba, who was calling from Washington, D.C. Dr. Ishwat was told that Lieutenant General Aziz Khan, who was the chief of general staff at that time, wanted to have a chat with him. What that led to was Dr. Ishrat having to reroute his journey via Tashkent and Karachi, and eventually to get to Islamabad. The next morning, at 7 a.m., he was driven to the GHQ. And there he met 12 army generals, including General Aziz who as the right-hand man in the Pakistan army was assisting the newly minted chief executive of Pakistan, General Pervez Musharraf. Now, just a little bit more. It says the men Ishrat met in the meeting room at GHQ were seasoned army men with decades of command experience. They radiated raw power 
they spoke to him for an hour about his book, Pakistan, the Economy of an Elitist State. They mentioned that they had read the book closely and the ideas proposed were similar to their thinking. So, you know, it is stories like this that um, enliven the whole biography and give you a much more direct feel, you know, for the individual. And, you know, there is a, another session there. I won't read them all. This is the only one I intended to read on the working relationship with Shoka disease. <laughs> now, I know both sides. And, uh, and you know, the book very interestingly describes, uh, uh, you know, Shokat's ruthless Citibank sort of uh, developed or promoted style of management. Uh, and in the government, when you had to deal with him, first as foreign finance minister and then as prime minister, uh, and how working with him, uh, and then, you know, when he looked at the state bank and how he would look to operate, you know, with the state bank and how he worked with partners, it's quite amusing. So I would urge you to look at that. There is also a very interesting uh, multiple statements by Mr. Shams Kasim Lakha. And... Uh, he talks about the efforts at the NCGR, the National Commission for Government Reforms, that Dr. Ishrat was heading, and he had the status of a federal minister. And this was right after his state bank uh, stint as governor, up to 2005. I think this began in 2006. And he was looking then at reforming the government service, 640,000 people working in the government at that time. And what emerged uh, is described as a roadmap for reforms which would be rolled out over the next 10 to 15 years. Now, you know, if you think about that, it is our lack of planning, continuity, consistency that really derails us. You know, we make great progress and then suddenly we are back to zero and so on. Here was a blueprint that was developed by, you know, people with a lot of depth and expertise. But as often happens with the government, you know, whether the governments change or the governments resolve, or the enthusiasm for reforms weakens. You know, in the beginning, it's very strong. And then they see all the political pressures and compromises and bargains that have to be made. Uh, so, you know, Shams Laka also has a very interesting comment about how he saw after this report, which was an outstanding report, and it was not pursued. And he saw Dr. Ishrat was very dejected, and he, uh, you know, sought, along with the others in that group, to encourage him to persist. Of course, he tried it again under the PTI government. Again, you know, very solid recommendations. But, uh, you know, our governments have not yet shown the resolve to take the tough decisions and then implement them in that regard. Uh, you know, there's also a very interesting uh, a chapter on called the central banker. You know, what Sipten does is he goes through each phase, you know, the early years, the civil service, the state bank, the central bank part, the world bank part before that. And in the state bank, you know, I also saw that myself being on that board for three years, but much later that, you know, reorganizing uh, a public sector institution is a big issue, it's a big task. The opposition, the resistance, even when you are not told there is a res resistance, but you see it in the 
pace of implementation and the quality of implementation. But you know, he not only reorganized it, restructured it so the retail part of the state bank's role was separated out and the rest could be given its due attention. But it was the change in the corporate culture which allowed the state bank to hire real talent. That was not there before. You know, before you had very experienced and solid people, but the number of really talented people who would apply to the state bank for a job was not a great number. But that culture changed, and I saw the effects of that when I was on the board, you know, more than a decade later. And, you know, one has read, all of us have, this whole issue of state bank autonomy and what the IMF wants and all the political maneuverings around it. The fact was that the whole, that massive institution was completely restructured and effectively restructured. Uh, and we are now told it needs more autonomy. But all that work was done at that time. So what I certainly learned from it is that if the will is there, and of course you have the expertise and the depth, you know, it's not the autonomy that makes the difference. It's the quality of your efforts, and those were clearly there. Now, um, on Dr. Ishrat, you know, as an individual, you know, others will go into his, you know, obvious intelligence, uh, the wisdom, uh, the credibility that he has established, the pathways uh, that he found through very difficult situations to make progress. But I wanted to focus on two specific areas, and those are areas that I know better. That's why I'm focusing on them. So one is the banking reforms and privatization. I was in UBL at the time Dr. Ishrat came in as state bank governor. And I remember that in the first meeting we had uh, with uh, the heads of the three big banks, uh, that, uh, you know, he talked about the quality of the banking reforms and what they had heard and so on. And then he turned to me and he said, but why are there so many complaints about you? Not UBL, but about you. So it was, a, I tried to explain that if in a public sector institution, if you want to make progress and you make decisions, you will alienate a lot of people who are not used to things being changed. And there will be great resistance. So either you can sit back and do nothing and you'll be very popular, or you take the risk Make sure you're making the right decisions and move along, and that that is what we had done. And you know, he appreciated that, and uh, the issue was closed. But you know, there was also something else which is very relevant today. Sorry, I'm just going to keep track of the time that, you know, very relevant today, and I saw this at National Bank, a tremendous fear to make real decisions because, you know, the FIA will chase you and the NAB will chase you and so on. So especially the older staff uh, who had the skills, they knew how to do their jobs, but, you know, why should they stick their necks out? Uh, it was too much of a risk. They would just wait for the CEO and the board to change and they would survive. And it was actually when I was at UBL that I learned through working with Dr. Ishrat, you know, some of the ways to deal with this. Like, you know, we would, if we would look for something particularly sensitive, you can't do it with everything, but something particularly sensitive, if you structure it in a way that you had a justification for going to the state bank and getting their sort of tapa, you know, on what you are doing, uh, that could allow you to make great progress. And there were several very difficult cases. And, you know, 
through solving those with such support, we gave signals to many, many other defaulters. So the multiplier effect of that and that guidance, you know, one still recalls. Then, you know, we worked together on the, in the PBA, the Pakistan Banks Association, because even when I, after I left UBL, I was still the chair of the PBA. And the whole banking reform process as it was proceeding, you know, normally when you deal with the state bank, you know, you have recommendations to make, changes to suggest, and, you know, you may be heard, but you may not be heard enough. Uh, nothing may happen. What he started doing was to call the PBA to a quarterly meeting. So we would have the PBA Executive Council and we would have the State Bank team there, led by the governor with his deputy governors, the critical executive directors. So everyone involved was right there. So when something was put on the table, it wasn't that we will go back and study it. You know, there was some immediate reaction. And he would drive that. And I remember the number of decisions and issues that were addressed in those meetings and the culture that it built up, in the State Bank itself and with the PBA, which continued for many years thereafter. So, you know, these are tangible ways. You know, it established a consultative process. For example, before, State Bank would issue a circular and suddenly all the bankers would scream, you know, what, what is this you have done? You never talked to us and it has this effect and that effect. And here there was a process where the circulars would be raised in those meetings, material circulars, and they would be talked through. So what would emerge, at least we understood each other's position. You know, we may get agreement, we may not get agreement, but at least there was a quality dialogue. Then, you know, if you fast forward to 2008, the global financial crisis. Now, Dr. Ishrat was long gone from the State Bank. Three years earlier, he had left. But the quality of the reforms were tested in that crisis. And you know, we saw giants, you know, the big US banks that had to turn to the US government to be bailed out. Some of them went down, others dramatically restructured, old investment banks were seriously affected, over 100 years old, like Lehman Brothers and so on, Bear Stearns, etc. And uh, in the UK, Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, Lloyd's Bank, all these banks, Barclays Bank, big rescues uh, had to be mounted by the governments, which took many years to repay. But you know, you think our economies have never been in great shape, the Pakistani economy. Sometimes better, sometimes terrible, but never in great shape. And the banking system is obviously impacted by the economy. But the quality of the reforms was such, you know, bringing in good governance, management, accountable uh, boards, accountable management, that, you know, the quality was such that if you think back, how did the global financial crisis of 2008 affect us? It is hard to think of serious material examples of adverse impact. There were some smaller banks that had to go through difficulties and restructured and so on, but there was no big rescue effort required from the government at all. So that was a testament to the quality of the reforms, and I think we should keep that uppermost in mind. The second thing, area I wanted to talk about, you see, um, the thing is, sorry, let me just step back. Uh, you know, the global environment, again, we know is very weak. It was weak before Ukraine, it is worse now. Uh, but, and look at the big giants today uh, in, in the financial sector that are hurting. You know, Deutsche Bank has been going through major issues. Credit Suisse, the problems seem to be never ending. They keep changing their chief executive, it doesn't get better. Uh, 
One interesting example to remember, I don't know how many of you had heard of this bank called Monte de Pasci. This, you know, this bank is known because it's supposed to be the oldest bank in the world, set up in 1472. Now suddenly this bank, after the global financial crisis, you know, nobody hears much of this bank outside Italy, Tuscany Bank. But suddenly after 2008, it went into problem after problem after problem. The Italian government poured in money, it's still not okay. So you know when in our country, in spite of the weaknesses in the economy, uh, you have banks continuing to prosper. You know in terms of if you look at their profitability, the income statement is okay. You look at the capital base, that's quite okay. So our system has, has survived and prospered, and that must be traceable back to the quality of the reforms. Now I'll go through quickly my remaining comments. The second area you see is, is the microfinance aspect. Today, with all the difficulties in the COVID period, the attention to poverty and inequality has increased dramatically. And, you know, it was actually, and many people talk about, the terms keep changing, but they talk about loans to the poor, grants to the poor, but the grants are not sustainable, so you turn more to the loans. Now, it was in 2000 that Dr. Ishrat had set up the whole framework for microfinance banks in Pakistan, and then he set up the first one, which was Khushali Bank. And I had just moved from UBL back to City, and I remember getting a phone call saying, you know, I want City to put equity into Khushali. And I said, what is Khushali? And what is microfinance? And you know, for Citibank from New York, heavily into investment banking and so on, to suddenly think of financing something where you give 10,000 rupee loans, I mean, was unheard of. But you know, we got the approvals, we put in equity, so did Standard Chartered and five of the big local banks. And you know, now it has grown to a level, so we're talking 22 years later, that you know, of the about 10 million borrowers in Pakistan, total 10 million borrowers in the formal banking system, 8 million are with microfinance. Only two million are with the commercial banks. And you know, we see government after government, you know, wanting to do populist things. And they'll come up with different schemes, you know, for housing loans or SME loans, Tamiyab loans and so on. And what I think most have not realized yet, although the last lot, you know, moved in that direction, it's that the commercial banks are not equipped to do that. They don't know that segment. They don't know the poor people. And the way to help the poor people is to go through the microfinance sector. You can have the commercial banks intermediating through equity, through other support, through governance and so on. But this whole framework which exists but is not being used enough by the government for the social sector, not as much as it could be, that was created in 2000 and has built very well. You know, it's been impacted by COVID, but you will have issues to address. These are manageable issues. So again, I think that is a major thing to remember. Now, you know, in closing the legacy, you know, I have not mentioned, you know, the, uh, the IBA. Uh, my own engagement with that is limited. But I do know one thing that, you know, I had just one small example. I had been asked over the years to speak at, you know, LUMS and IOBM, CBM, and, and many of the others, and IBA. And, you know, I still remember that the IBA and Dr. Isha joined me on the stage while I was doing my talk. The IBA was the only one where throughout the talk there was no mobile phone that rang. 
you know, and the others constantly, you know, they would be taking their calls, they would walk out, they would walk in, you know, and the quality of the discussion then was impaired. The second thing was, that's more habit, but the second thing was, frankly, that the quality of the questions was noticeably better for whatever reason, whether they were paying more attention, whether they were better taught or whatever. And these two things stayed in my mind. But you know, I'm not qualified to talk about the IBA. But just in closing, what I will mention, you see, his legacies one knows of at the State Bank, for the overall banking system, for the IBA, and in other areas. But I think the greatest, greatest opportunity for us, you know, are these civil service reforms where the political support has simply not been there, political resolve to see it through. Uh, you know, all the work was done. Uh, recommendations are there. The reorganization of the government and of the civil servants, the pay and pension commission work and so on, all done. Just the government resolve. Now, you know, what we need, of course, we know is a government that is smaller and that is more efficient. But getting there is going to be a Herculean task. And I would just urge Dr. Ishrat that, you know, he should not ease up on these tasks. You know, the positions can change, but I think his stature is such and his reach is such and his credibility is such that I think that is a critical issue to continue pushing. The second thing, in closing, is, you know, these state-owned enterprises, which is a total disaster. No government has bothered with it in terms of the results. 200 SOEs, of which maybe not even 10% actually make a profit. And, and, you know, again, he brought about improvements there in the appointment of the boards that there were more qualified people who would look at boards on merit. I'm done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That, um, you know, but that system, you know, it, it roughly, it accounts for about 25 to 30 percent of our annual fiscal deficit. The actual losses, not netting out the profitable ones, but the, the, the gross losses, it's a massive number. And I think Again, Dr. Ishwat has done all the thinking and the research and the recommendations. It needs to be pushed. It needs to be plugged. Every government needs it. They all ignore it, but they have to deal with it. So in closing, I'll just say that uh, this actually in the crises of today, you know, where he may think his work is done, this is when he is needed the most. So I would encourage him in that direction. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. My name is Raza Jafri, and I'm a director on the board of the CFS Society Pakistan, and will be the moderator for today's event, today's book launch. Uh, for Dr. Ishwat Sen's biography. Um, it is indeed an honor and a privilege uh, to be moderating this session. I will try my best to bring you a glimpse of who Dr. Ishwat is, his accomplishments. It's, it's difficult to shoehorn him into, into you know, one or two accomplishments. The, you know, the, his area of work is, is so vast and so immense, and it is truly um, inspiring. And, and the idea will be to bring you a sense of what his biography is all about um, and, uh, and take it from there. So I will um, be introducing our esteemed panel one by one and uh, be calling them up on stage. Um, the author of Unraveling Gordian Knots, uh, Mr. Subten Nakwi, has previously authored the history of IB as well, uh, as well as works on Sadiqen and Khalib. It is an enjoyable read. Uh, Mr. Sumro, I think, uh, mentioned that it is about 400 pages long, but uh, I, I went through it very quickly. It is indeed enjoyable. It's got a lot of very many interesting anecdotes and valuable lessons 
uh, that teach and inspire. Uh, so, Sapten, if you could please uh, have you on stage, please. Eminent banker and author, uh, Mr. Sirajuddin Aziz is also uh, on the panel. Um, he's most recently been associated with Habib Bank AG Zurich. He earlier served as the president and CEO of Habib Metropolitan Bank, before that the CEO of Bank Alphala. Uh, Siraj sir, please. Dr. Homa Bakai is the Vice Chancellor of the Millennium Institute of Technology and Entrepreneurship, MITE. She was previously the Associate Dean at IBA. A scholar, analyst, and trainer, Dr. Homa has more than 25 years' experience. We're very privileged to have her with us. President and Editor-in-Chief of uh, the Bold Media Group, earlier associated with Reuters and the Associated Press of uh, America, one of Pakistan's leading journalists for print and electronic media, Mr. Amir Zia. And then finally, economist, central banker, civil servant, educationist, reformer, a giant of a man, um, part of the famed CSS class of 1964, served as public servant 1964 to 79, then worked for the World Bank as a senior executive from 79 to 99, looking after Africa and Asia. Between 1999 to 2005, he was the governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. In, in subsequent years, from 2008 to 16, he was the dean of IBA, and then lately the advisor to the prime minister on institutional reforms. Recipient of the Nishane Imtiaz, the Nishane Pakistan, he is Dr. Ishrat Hussain. Uh, please uh, join me in welcoming him on stage. Miss on stage, uh, we will uh, jump right into uh, the questions. I have some prepared questions, but uh, as you can see on, on on your tables, there are instructions to put in. Uh, put questions up and, and uh, obviously if I get the opportunity I will look to, to ask them um, from the panel. Uh, before we begin, um, so then maybe, maybe we can start with you, uh, right? And, and, and this is a book launch, I'm cognizant of that. Um, it is a biography on the life of uh, and the achievements of Dr. Ashwata Sen. Why did you choose him? Uh, I mean, I, I think it's, a, I, I suppose uh, his achievements speak for, for themselves. But what was the, the thought process behind this? How did you make that decision? How did it come about? Thank you, Raza. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the CFS Society Pakistan for putting this event together. I'd like to thank uh, Sarvat Saiba, you, uh, Zubair Sahib, who's just left, and of course, this eminent panel, Amir Saab, Dr. Huma, Siraj Saab, and of course, Dr. Ishut Sen, and the guests who are assembled over here. It's, a, it's an absolute honor to be on the stage with these people and to be addressing this August company. Why did I write the book? So I was studying actually at the IB when Dr. Ishat was transforming the state bank. And we would read about what he's doing um, in Dawn's EBR or other publications. And uh, there was a great fascination with what, what is happening with the state bank. And, and so I, I sort of knew of him uh, and uh, one day I actually went to the State Bank. Um, it was a class visit and we went over there, we saw, you know, the building was coming up, the State Bank Museum was, was about to, you know, the, the work had started over there, and many, many things were happening. And uh, so I was obviously fascinated. Then in 2013, I was given the opportunity, the privilege, to write IBA's history. And that was a second institution that I was sort of looking into, uh, but that was, of course, much more in depth. And during the course of our conversations, of course, I was, Ishut Saab was the director and, and, and he had commissioned the project and I, was, I would speak to him. We would, we would meet several times, both during business hours and sometimes after. And I realized that this is a 
remarkable story, not just what he's done at the State Bank, but also what he's done at the World Bank and civil services and all of those things. And when the chance came, I jumped at it. And I jumped at it for three very distinct reasons. The first reason was that in 2010 or 2011, I'd read this book called Why Nations Fail. And as Zubair Saab just spoke so well, strong countries are strong because of strong institutions. And in Pakistan, we've had a overall decline of institutions. He mentioned the SOEs, he mentioned many other things. Uh, and if you look at the development history of Pakistan, Pakistan was the strongest economically when we had good functioning institutions. We keep, we keep hearing about PIA developing Singapore lines and Emirates. We keep hearing about how the planning commission used to work and how we actually influence South Korea and, and other countries. Uh, we talk about how PICIC and PIDC and WABDA were wonderful performing institutions and, and they played an important role in the country's development. And then these institutions started to decline, including the civil services in some way. And, and that is, the country also started to unravel, just to borrow a, a word from the title. So through, so, and, but at the same time, we have this idea that countries are dependent on the political process. So we have this great man theory, we have this messiah theory that someone's going to come and completely change the country. And we've been doing that for the past sort of 70 years. But like I said, that doesn't work. So through his life, I got the opportunity to study those institutions. Now the civil services is the implementation or executive arm of the government, you know, providing key services. The state bank is, is running with the finance ministry, it's working on the economy of the country. Uh, education, higher education, extremely important. So the IBA then comes into play. And on the international front, there's a World Bank, and then there is the NCGR, the, the work he's doing institution reform. All of it comes together uh, as a key sort of, you know, different areas of development of Pakistan. So that was, that was one reason. The second reason was that, in my opinion, uh, we live in a pretty benighted, uh, age in which we don't have many role models to look at. If you look at in Pakistan or outside Pakistan, I mean, my father, I grew up, you know, he would talk about Fez Ahmed Fez or Josh Malyabadi or Ho Chi Minh or, uh, or Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. So there were these great people that you could look up to. But they are few and far in between both in Pakistan and abroad. And if you look at, you know, politics and this and that, you don't really see that. I mean, where are the great poets of Pakistan, right? So you do have this problem. Now, in that situation, when you find someone like Dr. Ishrat, who you can unabashedly admire, almost 60 years in public service, not a whiff of scandal, um, excellence in many different fields. He's led different lives, one would say. I mean, it's very difficult to meet someone who's succeeded both as an academic, as a world banker, as a central banker, as a reformer, as a civil servant. It, it's, it, it doesn't really happen that way. So. To have him here, it is very important that one should preserve his life and his thoughts, celebrate him in a book which is going to be present for other people to read and also when we're gone for posterity, for future generations. And the third point is connected to this one that when I was first talking to Dr. Ishat, he would tell me when I was writing the IBS history book but also when I was writing this book. There's so many lessons in it. There's so many moments of adversity that he faces, but he overcomes them one way or the other. Uh, he doesn't come from a uh, elite background, so he had to uh, work hard and move his way up, and that's really inspiring. And again, in this dismal, you know, despondency or whatever you want to call it, uh, it is very important that one keeps that spark of inspiration alive and fan it. Um, and inspiration can make you do great things. You can't borrow it or steal it. It has to come from within. But also you can take it from other people, other great people. And by going through those things, and, and some of those things are mentioned in the book, uh, and some of those things were mentioned by Zubair Saab, but there's so many others. I mean, if you, if you, if you read about how he was able to convince um, the newly made military dictator of Ghana, you would have read that, Jerry Rawlings, Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings, who wanted to go socialist, but Ishad Saab was sent over there on a, on, a, on a project by the World Bank to convince him to implement World Bank reforms. And World Bank, as you see, has this bad reputation 
of being an arm of the capitalist government. So here's a socialist dictator who's taken over a country and Ishatsav has to convince him. And he, he goes to the palace in the middle of the night, has a long conversation with this passionate young man, picks up the one thing that he is concerned about, which is development, and in the course of one night, he's able to convince him to turn around and actually implement the reforms. And to this day, the Ghani's economy has done extremely well. If you, if you look at the, and some of it is mentioned in the statistics, that it's been growing and it's one of the success stories of, of Africa. So all of this comes together and for me, there were these three reasons and I was able to learn so much just by my interactions with Dr. Ishwar and by writing this book. And I hope other people, both present now and in the coming generations, are also able to learn. Oh, thanks. thanks for that uh, answer, Saptan. I think uh, I wasn't exaggerating when I said you, it's, it's very difficult, it's next to impossible to shoehorn Dr. Ishrath into certain defined roles. And when you read uh, the book, uh, I mean, uh, you know, right at the beginning, I think his, his early education was with, in chemistry. Or, uh, you know, when he started off, he was a champion debater at university. Uh, we all know him in different facets. We, we know him as a central banker, as an educationist. But there is also the facet of his life where he's interested in the arts, so setting up or, or you, know, you know, really revitalizing the, uh, the Central Bank Museum or being the founding chairman of NAPA, um, you know, for instance. So, so a lot of those things that, you know, you, you might think you know Dr. Ishrath well, uh, but the book, I mean, uh, at least I, 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 you know, I found out a lot uh, that I uh, didn't know. And so, Dr. Saab, I'm going to turn to you now and and ask you, like, you know, you've had such a remarkable and inspiring uh, career. It's, 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 it's inspirational for me. Uh, just this story, the Jerry Rawlings and Ghana, I was going to bring it up, but Sipten brought it up himself. Um, so many accomplishments, so many different sectors, so many different disciplines. What makes you stay so motivated? What, what makes you tick? Um, and, and what makes you so focused on delivery and, and deliver it so well, um, if you can know? First of all, let me thank Shoeb and Servat and the CFA Society for organizing this event. I hold the CFA in a very high esteem because that's part of my own understanding that unless we have high degree of professionalism in this country, we're go going nowhere. In the CFA Society, because I have been a personal witness to this, I have uh, very much encouraged uh, this society and I'm very happy that they have kept up the standards. So that's my first uh, message. Now, the motivation started in my early life when I had to face a lot of adversity. I was an object of ridicule because of my height and because of my stature. I was very young as compared to the other students. So you could either get into a shell and suffer from an inferiority complex, or you take up the challenge and say, how can I disprove them? And how can I win their respect? I adopted, despite all the difficulties, the later course. And the same boys and girls who were teasing me who were harassing me, elected me as the vice president of the college union. Because I made an effort to excel myself in debating. I said, what should I do? I'm not equipped for sports. So you should not give up in the face of adversity. That, I think, was the starting point of my life. And then I completed my education. Then I realized when I was in University of British Columbia, Vancouver, doing my chemistry masters, that I'm not really a person who would be confined to laboratory all night. I'm a people's person. And I would like to do something which is quite different, uh, which can allow me to do things which are people-centric. So I decided that I will go give up my chemistry and I, will, I was offered a job by Dow Chemicals and a nationality of Canadians at that time 
which was in 1962, but I said nothing, no thank you, I want to go and compete for the civil service. I was underage, I spent two years. In the civil service I realized that my background is not appropriate for the kind of things I want to do, which is finance and, uh, and economics. So with newly uh, uh, married spouse of mine who was expecting, we went to Williamstown, which is six months under snow. We didn't have much money, and she had to carry when our daughter was born there in the trolley for the groceries, but also the baby. And those were the kind of conditions under which the adversity I ended up as the only non-economist in that class at the top of the class. So that again gives you an idea that adversity actually is a motivating factor for you to do and excel. And I was not very much convinced that master's is the only you know, terminal degree. So I was given an 18 month scholarship. We had two daughters and I had to finish my PhD in 18 months. Uh, usually people take four or five years. Again, a challenge and adversity and I had to do and work very hard under most difficult circumstances. Now these stories I'm telling you, and then I had to compete with a lot of people in the World Bank and I joined as a junior economist, and there it is not seniority, it is not your connections, it is not your loyalty, you have to prove yourself, your worth. And I got seven promotions in 20 years. So what I'm trying to make this point, that for the young generation, and I see a lot of young people, please work hard and persevere in whatever you want to do. Don't give up. I find a lot of despondency, a lot of negativity in our younger generation. That means you have already given up. You must be ready to say, I can do it. And I can assure you that you will have a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties, but work hard for your dreams, for your aspirations, and you would benefit not only yourself, but your own country. And that, I think, is what keeps me going. If you give up in the light of adversity, then the game is over. Siraj, so I'm going to turn to you now for one, one aspect of uh, Dr. Ishrit's career, and that's obviously banking. A lot of people know him as a central Banker, and and you were you probably crossed paths with him, uh, you know, when probably at maybe maybe in the 90s PCCI and then Bank Alpha and then the Habib Metro. So two questions in in one. I mean, obviously Zubair Saab touched on this a little bit, but maybe give us a sense of you know how different those times were in in the banking sector. I mean, this the sense you know give us a sense of the the scale of the challenge that uh, that Dr. Shit faced, and secondly his legacy. And I think again. Zubair Saab mentioned that, you know, the true test of whatever he achieved at the central bank came through in the next few years. But a lot of uh, very interesting things happened, right? Islamic banking came through, microfinance institutions happened, um, you know, uh, consumer banking took off. Um, and so what do you think his challenge was at the central bank? And then in terms of his legacy, uh, what stands out as his achievements uh, from, a, from, a banking, from a banker's perspective? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, allow me first to compliment uh, Sipten for excellent book, written in a very fine manner, easy to read, and once you start reading, you don't want to give it up. So 400 pages wasn't very difficult, ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you on that count, you can try it yourself. And the best part about his uh, chapters that he has uh, divided the life of Dr. Vishwathasen into various segments in terms of his uh, particular professional life so to speak, and, but he begins off with a historical background to that particular chapter, so there's everything that's historically connected. So I particularly like that vein of thought that he had. Um, until I picked up the book and started reading it, I thought I knew Dr. Saab. Um, I only knew 
him as a central banker, I did not know of the many things that he had done besides, particularly your years when you migrated from India to Pakistan and the first 29 years of your life when you got married. Reading that, you know, and I would urge every single youngster sitting here, you must read those chapters with great amount of interest because it tells you how to fight out adversity and stand out with prominence. I felt so much inspired reading just that part. Uh, he mentioned in passing about, uh, you know, uh, going off to do an 18-month uh, PhD program. If you read in details the kind of challenges that he had to face in terms of uh, lack of vitamin M, M being money, uh, and then the writing of the thesis, which he did after coming back to Pakistan and then went on to defend it back. Uh, great uh, inspiration in terms of this spirit. And uh, in relation to your particular question, uh, Raza, Pakistan, you see, during the period of the 80s and the 90s, particularly the banking industry was faced with political learning and political hiring. So that's what uh, Dr. Saab had inherited as a governor of the State Bank of Pakistan. Although Dr. Yaqub is a little bit of an unsung hero of the State Bank of Pakistan because I believe he started off the reforms in a very muted fashion. It was Dr. Saab's entry at the State Bank of Pakistan that gave a boost. <clears throat> so with defaulters all around, with political appointees, you know, manning positions of authority in the banking industry, I'm sure it must have been a very difficult task. I was then very junior in terms of the hierarchy, so we were dread to be asked to go to the third floor of the State Bank of Pakistan. Uh, the setup was more akin on the third floor to the Q block of uh, the Ministry of Finance in Islamabad, so you can understand, they could establish the co-relationship there. So you had to literally tiptoe so that, you know, your he the shoes of, uh, the heels of your shoes do not make any noise out there. Uh, with that kind of environment, suddenly we had a governor who said, I'm going to meet all the CEOs every month. Okay. And openness in discussion. Tell us what your issues are. I think uh, Mr. Sumer referred to the fact that he was the first one to initiate that every single circular of any materiality of the financial industry was first circulated through the forum of PBA to all the banks to give their feedback on its viability on this implementability, and then there were revisions made on the recommendations made by the banking industry. So that was a major move. Okay. Then, of course, uh, the famous uh, circular on uh, write-off and uh, restructuring that Dr. Sav, I think, personally authored, I would think so. But that gave a major relief to banks in terms of you know, cleaning up their books, which was very difficult for the rating agencies to be able to convinced that our financial industry was doing well. But following that event, I think uh, it has been a relatively easy period for the financial industry. And as said earlier, I think the challenge of the reforms really came in 2008. And the fact that the State Bank has only improved and has not gone into any regression, okay, gives value to the various processes that we brought about. Um, when I first went to the State Bank of Pakistan as a 20 year old, I was surprised that every single chair with the table had chains. Because uh, if they left their chair, I believe it was not available for him to sit again. So the, that's the environment. And suddenly we had workstations, we had computers, we had desktops there, we had laptops. The inspection department underwent a radical change. They were like the Gestapo for the banking industry. Okay, the whole environment change in terms of engaging in a dialogue to improve things. And I think that's a great contribution that, was, that came about from Dr. Ishwazen. And uh, there are several other things that may be later on here. Well, I will definitely come back to you, Sarat uh, Sab. I think, I think it's interesting that you mentioned that uh, things only improved, uh, central bank only improved. And I think that's testament to the sort of uh, work that uh, Dr. Ishwazen has done that it's institution building. It's uh, it's it's not, uh, and I think Saplen, you mentioned it's not. You know, we keep waiting for the Messiah. It's not. It's not that. It's it's actually strengthening institutions in your wake. Um, so not only the the SBP, but perhaps the the IBA as well. And somebody who goes around interviewing candidates who are graduates from IBA, you've noticed. Uh, you know how the programs have evolved and how 
you know, the quality of the graduates, uh, you know, at least in recent years, of course, has has improved. So and I think that's that's something that stands out, uh, Dr. Ishrat. And, and I think with that, I, I will turn to you, Dr. Dr. Homa. And, and there is a point in the book um, when I was reading it, and Dr. Ishrat, he's talking to somebody, I think, um, at the Indus Valley School, that the toughest job, and, and, and you can vouch for this, Dr. Saab, but you said the toughest job you had was managing faculty. And, uh, and given your position as the VC um, and, uh, at MIT, and, and you have been at IBS, is that a sentiment you can relate with? And in relation to that, in context of that, you know, how do you see Dr. Ishrit's turn around at IBS? Dr. Ishrit is. Oh. <laughs> and uh, all what uh, this man can accomplish. Although I've had the privilege to work with him for eight years. Uh, the reason that I have the title of Vice Chancellor today is because I've worked with this man. And it's not just me. I don't know how many people he has mentored to take top positions. People who worked with him, people he mentored, and his, his ability to be completely vulnerable about it, which is a quality that I see in very few people. For example, in what he just said, he told you about the fact that he was a short man and he was ridiculed and he fought back. The same is true for his hum very humble background. See, and also the fact that his life started in pa Pakistan in a refugee uh, camp and then uh, he was in corridors of power and decision-making tables. And, uh, you know, whoever thinks success happens overnight is dreaming because this book is all about how success happens when you work very hard. There are various people who have commented on who Dr. Ishrit is in the book. One of the comments that just stays with me because I had the distinction and the privilege and the honor to launch this book in 2021 at uh, the Literature Festival. And I literally got away with murder during this conversation. <laughs> I had said things which later on people said, how could you say that in front of Dr. Ishit? And I said, because I've worked with him for eight years and I know his capacity uh, when it comes to humor, when it comes to tolerance and all of that. Uh, I think that's, that's critical, his, his, his whole, his ability to let himself bear, which allows him to build teams. So what happened at IBA was team building, ownership, uh, creating, uh, creating an institute, creating, uh, uh, creating, uh, uh, in, initiating reforms that has made IBA what it is today. And ladies and gentlemen, I'd also like to share with you this fact. When this position was offered to Dr. Ishrat, prior to that, this position was offered to a former minister. And he said, what? IBA? Why would I go to a small institute? And then Dr. Ishrat took it up and turned IBA into what it is today. And I tell you, it's not just students, faculty, administration, the gardener, the swiffer. All of them, when you say Dr. Rishad, they will stop and will have something nice to say about him. I think very few people can do that. I was talking about uh, what he's written in the book. He says that in a nation of talkers, he is a doer. And I think that's what describes him. So I'm going to come to some fun part now. The people who have read the book, and the part that I loved about the book was about the young Ishrat. So Zubair Sahib just spoke about his being in... Uh, Shikarpur, and uh, when he came, went to Shikarpur, there were a lot of uh, burglaries and decoities happening there. And Dr. Ishrat thought he needs to put an end to it. And of course, the police was not cooperative. So he found out that there's this very infamous decoy who's sitting somewhere at a hotel. He took one constable, unarmed, went over there and actually grabbed him and had him jailed or whatever. When I was in a conversation with him, I said, Dr. Ishrat, what were you thinking? And he said, in retrospect, I think it wasn't so wise. But that's who the man is. And there's one more thing that I'm going to share, which again, Dr. Ishrat is going to look at me in one, one of those ways that he does. And that is that I spoke to people at State Bank. And I said, 
okay, tell me something which is not in the book about Dr. Vishrat. And he said, okay, those people said to me, it's a couple of them, he said, you know, behind his back, when we talk about Dr. Vishrat, we would say, it's email and female. And I was like, what? And I thought, no, finally the man has a scandal there. <laughs> no, you know what they said to me? And that is also something which is very close to my heart. He digitalized, started digitalizing the bank at a time when people didn't even think about it. And more importantly, he would actually move rocks to empower women. And that is something I respect this man so much for. Because I have seen it with my own eyes, young girls with children coming to his office and telling him, I'm going to quit my job and he'll leave. And he'll say, no, we'll, we'll establish a daycare center and we'll facilitate you and we'll let you continue with those careers. That is the kind of mentoring we need in this country. I always say that this country is suffering from what I call political and economic dyslexia, with all due respect. Despite that dyslexia, Dr. Ishrat has given us the recipe to turn things around. And I think that is critical and that is important. It's not State Bank, it's not um, IBA or all the other places that he's been. It's his sheer hard work and the, and the, you sort of, the, the sort of resolve not to give up that has turned Ishrat into Ishrat. And I have huge respect for the man. I continue to learn from him. And I think I'm not the only one. And all the books that you have read, I just want to say one thing. Where will you listen to it? Where will you listen to it? But you have closed the door to the door. Thank you very much. Thank you. Raza, just a little bit to add to what Dr. Bakai has said so well, we should remember that the only uh, female state bank governor in Pakistan's history was right after Dr. Ishrat. And it's mentioned in the book that Musharraf Saab wanted him to have a third term, uh, but he, he refused and he actually recommended her. Yeah. So what Dr. Bakai is saying about this you know, empowerment and all those things, I think Ishrat Saab is also one of the country's earliest feminists among central bank and other things, and that really needs to be appreciated. Let me clarify, I'm not a feminist, but I am, I am convinced because there is now empirical evidence from Ghana all the way to Guatemala that the highest return on investment in any country is on female education and female employment. So I was very much motivated by this particular empirical finding. So I don't belong to any ideological camp, feminist or anti-feminist, but I'm convinced that the only route to Pakistan to progress is allow 50% of its population to actively get going as far as the contribution to this economy is concerned. And the social development in our part of Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh, has done extremely well on the social development because they have empowered their female population. And this is a lesson we should learn. So I'm not a feminist, so I wanted to clarify. <laughs> I, I meant that you've been strictly opposed to you. But why? add something else and of course then Amir Zia will have very nice things to say. Say something else that, uh, that fascinates me about Dr. Ishrat in a society, in a, in a nation which is so polarized now, that he was a man who was sought after by every single government. PMLN, People's Party, the generals, PTI, because the value addition that he could bring and the fact that he was above petty politics. I think that's also a factor which we must sort of uh, talk about or discuss when we try to understand the phenomenon of Ishrat, if I may borrow from what Salim Raza said. So, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Amit Sahib, I'm going to turn to you now and, and I'm going to give you the floor. So, I mean, obviously you will, you will have, uh, I'm sure, your memories of Dr. Ishrat or your uh, past from your interactions, but but also I mean, given the fact that you are in, you know involved in the media, 
and and I think Sipten touched upon this a little bit that uh, you know you do have an environment of despondency and doom and gloom. How do you showcase? Uh, I mean, why doesn't the media showcase personalities and people like Dr. Ashut more? And I think I think obviously short of having him being head of Pemra and you know reforming that institution, what do you suggest? Uh, you know we can do to showcase more of Dr. Ashut and and like-minded people. Exactly to bring more role models in front of us. Yeah. But uh, let me start with a confession that uh, as a media person today I'm in a fix. I'm in a huge problem because as media people we are more fond of criticizing people bringing out scandals and uh, you know some sort of a naughty story so i'm mean, here i mean as uh, siptan has said that mashallah uh, dr shir saab has got six decades of uh, public service and not a whiff of a scandal and it's not that that we were very kind to dr shir saab or that his public relationing with the media was very good no absolutely not i think uh, it's not that we 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 are bad in our job i think because he has been so good uh, because I, mean, I always think that whenever a media person, I mean, you cannot trust the friendship of a media person. Whenever he is going to have a story, he is going to publish it. So, Doctor, we tried our best. When you were governor, we tried our best. And when you were at IBA, we tried our best. And and we desperately failed. So that is my confession and my admission. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it is an assembly of experts, and I think I am the uh, the only one person who is a non-expert. Media people. are uh, you know jack of all trades uh, i was reading will dora and he said that uh, you know this is this is an age of specialization where people are trying to learn more and more about less and less so a journalist has to know uh, you know uh, something about everything so we don't specialize so i don't have a you know journalistic uh, i mean that sort of economic training and i have not Uh, into finance or business or those kind of studies i'm just a, uh, a student of literature a student of literature uh, but yet i have been covering a state bank for the last 3 decades and since the days of dr yakub saab and uh, till to date uh, when raza bakar saab was there and uh, i must say this that uh, he is not one of the finest he has been the finest the finest state bank governor because i remember that when uh, he took reins of state bank those were very i mean testing times for pakistan the economy was i think in uh, if not worse shape i mean as bad as it is now but what has happened because they were right people at the right job the trust was established just like this it's all about perception so i mean i, I would say that the way dr shir saab interacted with the media it's not that he he kept his doors wide open or he he was reluctant to meet media persons it was very measured interaction whenever he met us and uh, i mean people like me who know very little about economy so we'll ask very innocent and sometimes dumb questions and we were uh, told that you know no question is a wrong question i mean answers can be wrong question is never wrong so i mean we were trained in that frame of mind so whenever we used to i mean as a novice and i mean without any background the way he explained it to us and very recently i interviewed him for uh, bol newspaper and again i mean uh, it was just like i was interviewing him for the first time in 99 or in 2000 uh, the way he explained things and uh, so i mean uh, i would say that what the future leaders who are who inspire to be like dr chirat they need to ask him one question the how he has managed to stay away from scandals i mean that is a big i mean it's a big question for me dr sir please shed light on this the, the the second thing is the second thing is that institutions i mean uh, as siptan saab i met him accidentally just two days back uh, in islamabad and i was wondering uh, that i mean who has written this book is fabulous book a great read a very easy uh, read and uh, you know one can finish it in two nights because i'm a slow reader i mean huma can finish it in one night 400 pages so i mean uh, he told me that you know uh, that he's very fond of uh, why the nations fail and is it why the nations fail it's a fabulous book it talks about institutional strength and uh, i think it's written through eurocentric point of view and uh, that's fine with us but i think that individual has also a role to play in history the role of individual cannot be in undermined what we have seen that state bank of pakistan for example it was never part of any controversy neither in the days of dr yakub saab or shimshad saab or you know salim raza and many others but why now it is all because of the quality of leadership i mean the way raza bakar saab handled it i mean he personally there were scandals about him i don't know right or wrong 
but uh, here I am being a bit, you know, journalist. So, but still we saw that, you know, State Bank of Pakistan for the first time uh, in history, it became controversial. And I remember that, I mean, two positions were very, I mean, two institutions when journalists are covering. One is foreign office and the other is State Bank. We never used to, we never take them lightly. So we always, uh, you know, covered them with very, uh, you know, we have to be very accurate about them. So it is quality of leadership uh, because of, uh, I would say that Ishra Saab enjoyed the level of trust, but now people are raising questions about it. The same goes with the IBA. I mean, uh, IBA, I would say it was transformed uh, during uh, Dr. Ishra Saab days. And again, there was a, you know, lack of leadership. We saw that, you know, after that we hear a lot of scandals. We hear that a lot of good people are uh, leaving IBA. We hear a lot of scandals about IBA. Again, I would say that leadership matters, the matters and the role of individual can never be undermined. So we need more individuals like Dr. Shil Saab to guide us, to inspire us. Dr. Saab, uh, okay, I just wanted to say this, that uh, Amir is constantly saying that why does Dr. Ishit not have a scandal? So there's again something that I'm going to quote from the book. The vice, uh, the vice president of the World Bank, and I'm going to read it here. In the World Bank, I created a series titled Against Formidable Odds to showcase examples like Ishrat, where people were honest and not bogged down by the system. I think that is why he didn't have scandals. And this is not coming, but we have to do the same thing. But this is not coming. And I think this vice president was an Indian doctor, is it? Chair, who is a chairman? Sanjay Vida, who said this. I was really impressed, you know, that he was actually uh, an ambassador for Pakistan, an ambassador who was known for his honesty and his uh, up, straight up being the kind of person that he is. Well, so my... I'll very humbly disagree with you about the two institutions who say the scandals. You may have a disagreement with uh, the policies of Raza Bakar or uh, with uh, an, any other person, but the institution has really performed well. And that is what I'm proud of, that after 15 years, it is still the best public sector institution. <laughs> And IBA, there was one single incident which was caught by the social media, and you know what the social media is doing. So I'm very proud of both these institutions because my whole effort is that my predecessors have left this institution in this shape. I will take it to that shape, and my successors will take that further up. That is how institutions are built. The personality cult, which we are so very fond of, is not the solution to the problem. So you are absolutely right to disagree with the policies of the governor or with other, but please do not think that this is scandal for the State Bank or for IBA. I would certainly humbly request you to change that particular perception you have. You have every right to disagree and you disagreed with my policies also. I mean, I was criticized for Circular 29 which wrote off a lot of loans of defaulters, but the industry, which was sick industry, was revived. And most of the loans were for the small, you know, uh, uh, denomination. They were not for the big guys, uh, low ticket items. And I was criticized by the media, and I uh, took upon myself to defend why I had done that. So you have every right to disagree, but please consider that the institutions are still much stronger than they were before. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sir. I mean, to, to, for put, putting things in context, uh, you have always been uh, you know, gracious, generous, and this shows the way you have uh, you know, defended those institutions. I think uh, we all should learn from it. And uh, while talking about uh, Dr. Saab's generosity, I just want to quote one anecdote, I mean, if I may, uh, because I mean, uh, uh, not all are included in Siptan's book. <laughs> so the thing is that, I mean, uh, Dr. Saab, I mean, we all know about what he has done big. So the, what he has done small is very important. Uh, I remember that uh, when I was working for the news, I was at Sarita and we were planning to launch a weekly. Uh, I asked, requested Dr. Saab to write for us. And uh, he told me that uh, I need to have good company. Uh, that was his quote-unquote. So, uh, 
we relaunched our weekly newspaper, the weekly business section, named it Money Matters. And I think it was Dr. Saab who inspired it. And then all the top names of Pakistan economy, they used to write for it. And then a few years later, uh, when we saw that, you know, Herald has died down and Newsline Monthly has died down, I was launching monthly narratives. It's a small journalist-led venture. And some of the top brands and names are writing for us. I requested Doxa. And uh, even the first issue had not come out. And Doxa was generous and gracious that he wrote for us. And because he wrote for us, I managed to convince many other uh, high-profile writers like Dr. Huma and, Dr. <laughs> and Siraj Saab to write for us. And Asif Qureshi is sitting over here. So many others that, who wrote for us. Uh, so, I mean, that's I indebted, sir. Thank you very much. The way you have supported, you have supported. Dr. Ishrat is Thank you very much. Thank you for this very candid discussion. Um, Sir, I'm going to turn to you once again. Um, and, uh, and I think we, we, it, it's interesting just to borrow or, or take on from what Dr. Ishrat said, uh, you know, the fact that institutions are stronger in his, in his wake, and I agree with that. Uh, but in your perspective, in your view, you know, the governance you know, within financial institutions. I mean, governance in general, but particularly within financial institutions. Um, you know, how important is that? And, and you know, what, how has Dr. Ishit contributed? I think uh, the time that uh, Dr. Ishit then arrived at the State Bank of Pakistan, 10 new banks had been formed in the country. And that is where the governance took a nose dive in the constitution of the boards there. It was all family, and family who knew nothing about finance. So consequently, you can understand what kind of a board meetings they would have, and how, what the management would be like. Uh, so that is where Dr. Saab came in very heavily and said that you have to have independent directors, you need to have qualified directors, and the progress has been so good in terms of the formation of the subcommittees at the board level now in the financial institutions, I think that is something that's very formidable and must be appreciated. Uh, with the permission of Dr. Saab, I think uh, I need to refer to some aspects about Dr. Saab, um, particularly the younger people sitting out here. Please do understand that, uh, you know, he has been a resounding success vis-a-vis -vis his career. It's not without hard work. The kind of diligence that he has shown, the kind of pursuit that he had that he must be successful, the fact that he decided when he was posted in what was then East Pakistan to learn the Bengali language before going to office and after returning from office, he would go to one particular neighbor and learn Bengali to the extent that when uh, Abdul Mumin Khan was the Munim Khan was the governor of uh, East Pakistan, he called up Dr. Saab to find out about the flood situation and Dr. Saab responded in absolutely chased Bengali. So when he came back, he said, I want to meet the person who spoke to me. And when he was presented as an Urdu-speaking West Pakistani, he was quite surprised. But that's the, that's the dint of the hard work that you can notice all along the book. You must read it for reasons that it encourages. If you really want to understand, the other day, Dr. Sa was at a launch of a book, and he mentioned leadership is all about inspiration. And I can assure you, these 400 pages are just pure inspiration. Try it yourself. Refer back to pages 165 and 409, and it also leaves what the legacy is of Dr. Ishrita Sahel. It talks about it in detail. Uh, one comment that uh, President Musharraf made about uh, Dr. Saab is very important, I thought, and that is where I think uh, most of us falter in our corporate lives. Uh, President Musharraf is quoted here as saying that I have great respect for Dr. Ishrat Hussain for reasons that he spoke when required and was not afraid to express an opinion which could be against my own. Uh, the fact that uh, he is, refuses to be psychophant at any point in time in his life is something that I have admired the most, he says. And I think, Dr. Sab, uh, that's what you have trained us and uh, we continue to speak our mind and I hope to God that the younger generation will continue to speak their mind and uh, we move on to the path of progress. But do read it because it's pure inspiration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shah Saab. Uh, this, this is now a question actually from the audience. This is from 
Shweb Saab. And, and, and I think the question is that as a nation, sometimes we're not very good at marketing and promoting ourselves and maybe, you know, our bad tends to get highlighted more. And you've, you've spent very many years, uh, about 20 years at the World Bank, so you've uh, stayed abroad. Um, what advice uh, would, you, would you give? I mean, how, how can we improve this? I think we have to start appreciating what good we have done and what wrong we have done. But if you have such clear black or white, then things are hmm. polarized. Hmm. So I had a friend who used to be the Washington Post correspondent for South Asia. Um, and I asked him, why do you write all these negative stories about Pakistan? She said, Ishrat, you come with me and observe my conversations with the people from different walks of life. And that is what I reflect in my dispatches. You come with me to India and they will go out of the way to defend even the worst wrong the country has committed. That, I think, is the distinction between the two. Hmm. If we ourselves are contributing to this negative image and perception about the country, why should you blame the Washington Post or the CNN or Al Jazeera or anybody? Let us start it from our own home. There are a lot of things which are wrong, say so. But there are a lot of things which are right in this country. But we never talk about right things. We never celebrate our wins and victories. We are all so stingy in praising the people who have really done well. We are so generous in criticizing and finding faults. And that is what Amir was saying. He was always, or his community is always trying to find what is wrong with this. And that is 8 to 11 culture, which has permeated through our younger generation also. So that is the reason why hmm. I, every time I go to it, I've never refused any invitation from a school or to the university because that is the consistent message I want to give to them. Um, so we're, we're coming to the end of the panel discussion. Um, Dr. Omar, you've, you've got a keen eye on, on politics, international relations. You mentioned the polarized landscape. You know, what, what does this country need to do to, to ensure that in future, I mean, obviously we keep, keep getting people like Dr. Ishat. I mean, they're not lost to the system. Um, you know, what, what do you think uh, needs to happen? Uh, you know, so that, uh, I mean, and, and I know Dr. Ishat would, would, would love something like that. You know, he li likes to leave a legacy in a wake. So how do you, how do we improve the system in, in your view? I really don't have an answer to that. I would be... <laughs> the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize <laughs> if I had that. But perhaps what I can see or what continues to baffle me and which also captures who Dr. Ishrit is that as individuals, we are amazing. We are fantastic. We do amazing, I mean, we just do the unbelievable. Whether in this country, look at the private sector, or whether abroad, we rise to new heights. But collectively, as people, we are not able to harness and garner that expertise, that desire to move on, that desire for progress, and turn it, turn it into progress for Pakistan. I think that's what it is. And one more thing, because I'm associated with education, we are a very young country. We are 60% youth. How can this country move forward if we don't turn this youth bulge into an asset and I don't see policies for that. So that's, that's my, my two cents. I wish I had Dr. Ishrit's optimism when perhaps 20 years down the lane. <laughs> and and, and, and Amasab, um, you know, we've seen uh, Dr. Ishrit also, I mentioned it in passing earlier, but uh, you know, he's maintained a keen interest in, in, in the arts. Uh, so, so I mentioned his association with NAPA, with, the, uh, with NAPA, the, the Indus Valley School. He also introduced a liberal arts uh, program at, uh, at IBA. So how do you see this aspect of, of his life and, and the role it plays in promoting culture and, and maybe uplifting communities?
So I was saying that uh, this represents the well-rounded personality, but I think uh, I'm not well-equipped to speak about art myself. I'm a very, uh, you know, unartistic person. Uh, but I can, what I can talk about is that uh, uh, Dr. Sub has written many books. And one of my favorites, which I would say that uh, uh, should be a reference for everyone, is Governing the Ungovernable. It's a treasure house for every writer, scholar, and who, whoever is interested. I mean, the question which you were asking uh, from Dr. Huma. So it is answered in that book. Uh, and I think we should, like CFA has organized this uh, you know, book launch, we should be having more such discussions, maybe not at such a fancy place, and, a, and an ordinary place that we talk about more about books, more about ideas, celebrate lives of people like Dr. Ishra Saab. So that is a must. And of course, I mean, you talk about art and culture, so that, that shows that, I mean, uh, his many facets of his personality, uh, that's all. And, but I, I will highly recommend that uh, governing the ungovernable and uh, the pa Pakistan elite state. May I just say yes? <laughs> I was going to actually request because one of the things that you picked up uh, when you when you read the book, um, um, this is, uh, and, and again, I think we've asked what motivates you, Dr. Ishrat, we've asked what keeps you going, but we haven't asked what you do to relax. And I think when I went through the book, it is, it is poetry, it is fairs. Is, is that right? So, so maybe, maybe we can request you to, yeah, no, no, could we have that then? <laughs> no, no, maybe we can. Yeah. <laughs> guess, guess <laughs> I have not had one discussion on the stage with Dr. Ishad and I've done several where I've not asked him to do this. <laughs> वो जो इसको मैंने बताया था सितंबर को कि मेरे शायरी से किस तरह से रकबत हुई पहले मैं साइंस का स्टूडेंट था तो कोई शायरी वारी नहीं आती थी मुझे और ना उसपे कोई था तो मैंने इसको सुनाया था कि फैसा जो थे वो आए थे कराची हैदराबाद में मुशायरे में शोएब साहब जमाने में नए नए युवान का वो कू हुआ था मार्शल लगा था तो वो फाइनेंस मिनिस्टर थे और जैसे हमेशा होता है वो एकाउंटेबिलिटी की बात कर रहे थे साहब की बात तो फैस साहब ने कहा कि हम खस्ता तनों से मौत से बो क्या माल मनाल की पूछते हो जो कुछ भी हमने भर पाया वो सामने लाए देते हैं दामन में है मुश्ते खाके जगर सागर में है खूने हसरते में लो दामन हमने झाड़ दिया लो जाम उठाए देते हैं वो सुनकर मुझे इतना मजा आया कि उसके बाद में मैंने फैस साहब को पूरी तरह पढ़ा याद किया और आज भी फैस साहब को मैं पढ़ता हूँ जब भी कोई मेरे ऊपर टेंशन होता है तो मैं अपनी म्यूजिक और शायरी इसकी तरफ अपनी तवज्जो दिला देता हूँ इट्स अ वेरी सूदिंग इफेक्ट ऑन यू तो मेरा तो ये है कि आपको अगर कोई अपनी मेंटल एग्नी है या परेशानी है I can assure you both music as well as shairi will soothe your nerves. So, this is my experience. Ji, please, please. I want to give you a question about Dr. Saab's relationship. Dr. Saab does a lot of reprimand. Tell me about it. Dr. Saab does a lot of reprimand. Tell me about it. हुआ ये कि आप स्कैंडल्स की बात कर रहे थे ना अमिर साहब हुआ ये कि एक जगह मुझे दावत मिली बोलने के लिए तो मैं वहाँ पहुँच गया उस वक्त डॉक्टर साहब स्टेट बैंक से मूव कर गए थे आईपीए पता नहीं डॉक्टर साहब को कैसे पता चला मैं उस इधारे में जाके मैंने बात की थी कोई तकरीर की थी डॉक्टर साहब मुझे कॉल Oh, man, go, sorry about it. Uh, uh, I didn't realize. He said, don't lend your name. Scandal se bachne ke liye. Dr. Saab ne protect kiya tha mujhe. Thank you so much. I think this was a fantastic discussion. Thank you for being a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, we will, uh, uh, you know, have uh, uh, the opportunity to have a book signing by Dr. Ashwath and refreshments. But first, uh, maybe, Sarvath, you can come up and, uh, you know, run us through the, the mementos for the panel. Thank you so much uh, once again. And thank you for being a wonderful audience.